Hey listener fan thingies, this is Darwin from Darwin's Deviations and uh, uh um what what was the line again? Oh no. You ruined it. What kind of a man are you? You can't even make a short clip. Shut up. Darwin, why are we even doing this? Because we're desperate. <laughs> You're listening to pods like us. Ah, what is their show even like? I don't know. Does anybody even listen to them? We all just want to mooch off the free marketing, but... Uh, <sighs> I hope I don't regret associating with them. No worries, Darwin. They'll be the ones regretting it. Pods like us won't let me cuss, but if you want profanity, check out my depravity. Um, Darwin, that sucks. Shut up. I'm starting this recording now because I want to grab this conversation while we're here. Sure. Because um, it's nothing to do with your show, this, but I think uh, it's important because it's been interesting to me lately that with Tim Sale. So now that we recorded, we can say to people, or I can say that his work is very important, especially at the moment. And we're, what, what we're doing, we, we were just having a general chat about illustrators and comic book artists who worked with pencil and colours and paper as opposed to digital. They did it by hand. And we came on the subject of Tim Sale and his work with the Batman series, The Long Halloween. So I'm going to say now that a lot of these modern interpretations in the films of these comic books are based on those works by the people who actually created the physical rather than the digital illustrations like Tim Sale. So the modern, the most recent Batman is actually based on that. And for anyone who doesn't know Batman or whatever, you would also know his work possibly from Heroes because he was the artist who who did all the pictures for the series Heroes. Yeah. He also is the, the artist who revitalized um, Daredevil in yeah. in the late 80s with the yellow, bringing back the yellow suit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. He did a, a run. He did so much great work with Jeff Loeb as his writer. Um some of the most like landmark comic books ever made came from that duo. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So it's nice to have an interest in multiple things and not just the subject of your show. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's important. Um, I was raised by people who constantly stressed like be well-rounded be well-rounded like find as many things you love as possible and explore them you know um so i've always kind of stuck with that and there's a lot yeah (laughs) yeah yeah i mean as soon as i could i started reading comics at a young age uh, got into films at a young age music at a young age Mm -hmm. i mean i'm i'm some people would say older. Um, So, I mean, got into computers as as soon as I could and gaming as soon as I could. So it's just to keep your, like you said, you know, it's make sure that you're well-rounded and you, you are open to looking at different things. So don't be stuck in where you are. If something suddenly appears, I'll think, Oh, what's that all about? And I'll try to look into it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, um, it breeds curiosity in all things right um which is a great characteristic to have um i don't because i i played music right i was am a musician um as well as my co-host so we were always into comic books i my mom because of my mother i'm I've always been had a deep appreciation for literature, for Mm. the classics, for history. That's what I studied. Um, So, yeah, I I try to mix it up. Definitely. I think bringing bringing all those separate perspectives together can be really helpful. Like when, for instance, for the show, when we investigate something, when we're researching something, I have a lot of different lenses that I can view it through. 
you know, and I can move from one lens to another and I can find interesting overlaps and see, just see it from angles that some people can't because, you know, they don't, they don't have that in their, in their kit as it were. So instead of doing a proper intro, I'll just say uh, to everybody listening, I'm speaking with Jordan from Campfire Tales. Hey, Jordan, thanks for chatting with me today. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to be here. Sorry for the cold open. (laughs) Yeah, I think people will like it because it's just natural chat. That's all it is. Yeah, I like it. So have you had any actual paranormal experiences yourself? Oh man, I, I wish I'm, I'm one of those people who have, I'm so I've always sort of been desperate for an experience that I can't explain. I've had a few like close calls and I pretty much like I found rationalizations for, for things, but my co-host has had a ton like we grew up together and he was always having experiences from you know from the earliest age so his fascination was always i don't know um his is more connected psychically i guess you could say and my interest has always been more academic um I just want to know about it, you know, and that's why, that's why I want an experience so bad because I would love some personal confirmation. Well, the interesting thing that you just said there, because that, that then speaks to me from, from listening to your show, because when you do the open, it's, it's you actually giving the, the background of what you're going to discuss. So for about 10 minutes or so, you will start with, um, like I said, a description of the subject and the background and look into all of the, you know, all of the history of the bits, the bits and pieces that make up the, the myth, the legend. And then you, Mm -hmm. the other two of you together, you and Ryan then discuss that between you and look into every little aspect and, in, in in full detail and very interesting detail as well, where you'll look into, does that match with that? Does that go with that? And then occasionally you'll mention where there's similarities between what you're talking about and other uh, urban legends or myths as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, the concept really was we, we want to tell scary stories, right? I mean, it's, the whole concept is to tell campfire stories, but there's a thing that happens with these cases, which is over time they get bent, they get reshaped, they get reformed by people telling the stories over and over again. And which is an essential part of society. That's the way people function, right? Like the telephone game is an essential part of what it is to be a human being. So it's not that we're against that happening, but I think it's important to Ryan and I that we take that time after we tell the story to discuss the real world events that inspire the story as stripped down as possible, assess the facts of what happened. Um, And that that keeps it clean for us. It feels good because in that first 10, 15 minutes, we can follow the advice, you know, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. And we can just tell a good story, right? <clears throat> and then we can talk about those those um, moments of creative license that we took during the story. We can talk about what inspired them, um, decisions we were making while writing it. Um, yeah, and that that's basically what we do. So... Is it um, you're both friends and you were already having these discussions and then you just thought that you would move that into an official podcast, into an official medium for you to be able to get that information because you were sort of thinking that whatever you're discussing between the two of you is interesting and I'm guessing other people have heard you chatting and thought you should do a podcast with that. What is the actual history of the podcast? 
Well, um, to be honest, okay, Ryan and I have been in bands together since we were kids. Um, yep. We, <clears throat> so we spent a lot of time in, you know, in the backs of vans or in the backs of clubs, just like killing time together, right? Um, and yeah, these discussions happened a lot. Um, but really what the catalyst for the show was, was I'm married. Ryan's about to get married. We're like, we're well into adulthood at this point. Right. And we realized at a certain point that as the years went on, we were spending less and less time together. Right. We, I mean, we've been best friends since we were, I don't know, in grade four. Wow. So coming up on 25 years that we've been, been best friends. And, but we realized that we were spending a lot less time together. We were, you know, the gaps between even a sent text message were getting noticeable. Um, and we wanted to, we've always, we've both always been fans of podcasts. We've been a fan of the medium. We've had weird conversations about weird stuff our entire lives. So we sat down and we made a list of possible niches to be in. And this one made the most sense. We, um, we both love it, but for very different reasons. And we felt like that would make the most interesting dynamic, but that was, that was really the, the impetus for the show was for us to spend more time together as friends to have an excuse to get together and, and chat for, you know, three or four hours once a week. Um, and that's worked, but it turns out people also like to listen to it. So that's pretty cool. (laughs) That's a good byproduct. Yeah. There are actual subscribers to the show. They'll keep listening to your show. And so that's, that's always a good thing is when you can keep that audience that are listening to you. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's huge. I think um, we've been able to, we've managed to, to stay consistent. And I think that's the biggest, that's the biggest thing. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, consistency has been huge. And we've, we did immediately off the bat have a response that sort of shocked us. Um I think this like this niche of podcasting was way more active than we realized. Yep. We both had a few shows that we really loved from, you know, that were in this space, but I didn't realize like the sort of rabid fan bases <clears throat> that these shows have. <clears throat> Absolutely. I mean, is, is that a cat behind when, you? Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I know she's like doing flips and <laughs> oh yeah, yeah um, it's, it's like having a gymnast behind you yeah well there's actually another cat there with it it's just black yeah the, so they're both you, black and the, the, they're against a dark colored sofa yeah. so you've got occasional bits of white will appear and I'm like what is that <laughs> yeah. see what it is now. Um, <clears throat> so we we didn't realize until we started the show how how crazy the fan bases were for for shows like this because i mean we released our first episode and in um the first 48 hours we had no i know some some people get weird about it but i have no problem talking about actual numbers you know i i think it's important to be like to be open with stuff like that. Cause when I, when I, when we started podcasting, it was so hard to get someone to tell you what to expect. Yeah. Like I, you can't find, it's so hard to find people that will talk about numbers and so that you can get a feel for like what's normal and what isn't. And so when we started in the first 48 hours, we had a thousand plays on our first episode. Wow. Wow. And I know that's that's not normal, right? I've had friends who start podcasts and they might not have a thousand plays for the first few months, right? Um, 
but there was a response immediately, which was cool. It was sort of, it sort of, um, it like strengthened our resolve. Like we realized like, oh, this is more than just hanging out. And it, we realized that very quickly because of that. And we always, you know, we're, we're guys who we gave up the like, man, it'd be great to be famous thing a long time ago. Yeah. You know, we were like, we grew up playing in bands. So of course we used to have that, but by the time we were, you know, getting married, going to college, all that, we were like, oh, we're, we're going to be normal guys who play guitar on the weekends, you know? Yeah. Um, but when that, when that like thousand or so people listen to an episode in a day, day and a half, like it kind of sparked that old feeling, you know, that old, like, Oh, we might be onto something here. Um, which was cool. That was cool. And we've just kind of wrote it out. We're at almost a year now. Well, it's, it's a subject that is, um, very much of, uh, it, it's a very well followed subject as podcast and media itself to, to be talking about the paranormal and conspiracy theories and all these things. Anyway, it's, it's huge, but I think added to that is the fact that you've got the relationship between the discussion, you know, the discussion between yourself and Ryan. I always think that when you've got multiple people, one or more than one person on a show, well, anybody on a show, it's about your own, uh, how you are as a person that brings people in. So, because you've got one paranormal show, you've got another paranormal, you, you're always going to have those there. So the, what gets people in isn't just the, the what you're talking about, it's you as people as well. And I think, so that's one of the important things that's pulled people in. I will say that, yeah. but you've also got the production values as well that you've had from episode one, where you've got those sound, you've got the sound in the background of the, the campfire. And although I still get the picture of you and Ryan being sat at a real campfire recording it with a foot, with an old four track tape recorder. That's the sort of oh, feel yeah. that I get by the sound that you get there. And that's an incredible production sound that you've got. That's awesome. Thank you. That I mean, that means a lot. That's really the goal, right? Yeah. I, I would like, I, that's the atmosphere that we try to create. Um, but yeah, we coming from, uh, you know, home recording was a lot of what we did. Yep. And especially Ryan, Ryan is a fantastic sound engineer. He, his sound design work, it, it shows on the show. It really does. Um, his, his, the skills that he brings to the table in that are invaluable. I think a lot of people learn as they go when they start podcasting. A lot of people are like, they're learning how to even use their, their recording software while they're making their show. Right. And we had a distinct advantage in, yep. we've spent, I don't know, probably thousands of hours using those softwares. So yeah, that's that's been handy for sure. And just having things simple like mic technique, knowing where to be in relation to your microphone while you're speaking, um, how to treat a room that you're going to be recording in, yeah. things that go a long way for for sound. Yeah. Well, well, to geek out for a moment, I'll just I've said this to people before recently, but I'm actually using an interface that is that has a real life four track tape recorder plugged into it and my microphone is plugged into the four track tape recorder so that's, excellent. that's how I do mine wow okay is that just like a, a is that just like a personal like point of pride or like what do you is there a, a physical result that you get that you like? Um, there's a result that I, that I like. I mean, um, I've had the four trap tape recorder for about 30 years. And um, even when I've recorded demos on it, even in the digital age, 
well, and, and that when I've recorded demos, I've taken them into studios, and the engineers have said, "Well, I don't want to do. I don't want you to do that again at all because I like the sound of that." And yeah, the engineers will say that, and anybody will say that in the studio. Well, why why re-record that when you've got that and you've got the warmth of the sound from doing it that way as well? Where I think digital, you can almost sound there's too much of a clean to it and there's yes. no hiss to it in the background so i got used to it for that so in a sense it's almost like it's set up like that because because i'm recording music that way anyway in this room i might as well just leave that and then it's it's plugged into the uh, interface to the comp to the laptop to then transfer it yeah. to, to digital i might as well just leave that in place rather than buy any more equipment just leave that there, and then that's there for both. And admittedly, yeah, that, there, there is a warmth to the microphone sound as well by doing that way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a, a warmth and a clarity to recording on tape that you just don't get digitally, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's Digital recordings are, like, comparatively, they're very sterile. Yeah, they, you know they they take out the they. It's like they suck the real life out of the sounds, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, it's it's almost like over compressing a, a compressing a sound. If you do that, yep. it takes the the life, the ongoing life of that sound out. Yeah. So how did you how do you actually? Uh, decide what subjects you're going to touch and in those other episodes when you have guests how do you decide what guests you're going to have um okay so ryan and i each have a massive list of potential subjects because we we really do love the niche that we're in I spend a lot of time when I'm not working on the show, I'm listening to or reading about things in the, in the, in our niche. I'm reading, you know, books about cryptids. I'm reading, you know, books about hauntings and yeah, all that. So anytime I stumble upon something, it just gets added to the list. Like I'm going to look into that later and I'll, I'll just add it to the list. So we try to, because there there seems to be three three big categories within what we do, which is cryptozoology. There's the UFO stuff and paranormal stuff, hauntings. Um, so we I try to keep that spread out. Like the idea is to, you know, the people who listen to us who really love the ghost shows. They they don't have too long to wait before they'll get another one. And the same with people who are really into cryptids and people who are really into UFOs. They, they'll never none of them will ever have to wait too long before they get another show that they really love. Um so we try to I try to keep those pretty evenly spread out. And when it comes to specific, honestly, I'll just look down the list and when one of them piques my interest, I'll I'll just do a quick Google of it and read a paragraph or so. And if I, if I feel like I can write, you know, 12 pages on that this week, I'll do it. Right. That's that's good because then like you said, you are um like you said, you you are not doing the same similar subjects week to week to week to week you are varying it so like you said yeah. you'll you'll pick a you'll pick an urban myth one week or, or, or a ghost story one week or you'll pick a uh an alien slash ufo um story or you'll have a guest yeah. one week and because you're mixing it up that's keeping the constant flow of oh he's not talking about the same sort of thing week after week after week it's varying it yeah but like you said, because you're rolling to a different subject here, there, and there, if somebody's only inter if somebody's more interested in certain thing, you will get back to something similar to that at another date. Yeah, yeah, because I know some of our listeners 
are there because they're interested in the paranormal. And they might only listen to, you know, one out of every three episodes. They might see, you know, that we're covering the Betty and Barney Hill ab- alien abduction story and go, um, I don't care about that. And they may wait, you know, but when we drop a ghost story in two weeks, they'll be back. You know, they'll be there for that. Um, And yeah, with guests, I... I think it's really important to, I like to have conversations with a person before the interview because in addition to the main, to the main episode, every Tuesday, every single Friday, we release a fireside chat where we interview someone and that, so I like to have conversations with them beforehand. If there's someone that I don't know already I like to I like to chat for a few days and establish a baseline. I want to know what matters to them. Right? Yeah. Um I think that brings the most relevant interview possible out of someone. Like I don't early on I would have people on and I would ask what I want to know. Right? But Instead of doing that, what I do now is through conversation, I find what they're into right now, what they really want to talk about, and that's the direction I push in. I basically try to give the guests an opportunity to talk about what what's already on their mind. So, hey, this is Tim for Bad Counsel. You want some good counsel? Keep listening to the smooth, dulcet tones of Marv on Pods Like Us. <laughs> okay, so I'm going off on a tangent then. Is there a specific um, story or incident that's on your mind at the moment that you can't stop thinking about or researching or reading about? Yeah. Yeah, um, there. The answer to that is usually yes, and it, it definitely is right now. Um, I'm researching a place in Greece called Penteli Cave. Yep. Um, and it's had a pretty insane history. Um, basically, all variety of fourteen phenomenon has been experienced there by various people over the course of hundreds of years. Um, it's actually the, the cave where they quarried the stone to build the Parthenon. Right. Um, yeah. And then a little while later, they ended up carving out this um, Franciscan church out of the sides of the, the cave. It's like sort of built into the cave, this Franciscan church. Um, it's pretty wild, but people have seen, you know, they, they spot UFOs, lights in the sky over it. They have seen, um, lights in the, in the cave. They've seen unexplained figures. They've had, it's just, it's so bizarre. I I'm obsessed with those places, those places that John Keel called window areas, like, um, places where it just seems that weird things happen at a much higher rate than other places. Um, yeah. And it's one of those. So that's what I've been researching and um, writing about. It's, it's interesting that because there's a lot of places that where you have this, these, these phenomenon uh, or being reported as happening, like, I mean, you, you go you go back and you'll have you know the famous ones of the uh, you know the Bermuda Triangle where people where v- people get lost and everything and it's mm-hmm. it's interesting how these places get associated with these things and where these stories um, are aligned to these specific areas. I'm trying to think of some other yeah. places as um, well, like um, Stonehenge yep. is a huge one. People have had had a lot of experiences there. Um, there, I mean, they're all over the place. The uh, there's an Alaskan Triangle. 
there for some reason people who study this stuff love the triangles. Yep. They always like pick three points and and connect the dots. Um because there are a lot of you know triangles of strangeness. Um there's a lot of there are a lot of um US national parks that have insane numbers of of experiences that people have which there's a whole conspiracy behind that i'm i'm honestly not a conspiracy guy um it kind of turns me off but i i love i love the weirdness I'll, i'll get into that but yeah so what sort of research and um do, do you have you basically got a script that you follow or do you when you research do you just like write bullet points and little like re, almost reminder notes like one or two words to remind you i mean is it fully written out or is it written just as like little reminders um i have i come from an academic background so my research is pretty pretty rigorous yep um to a fault sometimes i i think i overdo it sometimes and end up taking longer than i need to um but i the first section of of the episode the story is definitely written out word for word yeah it's you know that's that's written but i also go into an episode with you know varying numbers like six to 15 pages of bullet points, notes, things I want to get to in the discussion. But oftentimes I'll get a half a page into those just because Ryan and I just talk. And, you know, if the, if the subject is something that we like one or both of us are like passionate about in any way, um, the bullet points are, aren't even needed. We will just tear through, you know, an hour of conversation and it's over. But, and man, those are great. (laughs) Those are great nights. Um, when you're not like looking up at how long you've been recording a few times. Yeah. But yeah, that's, that's the, that's the process. Yeah. Yeah. The best conversations are always when you don't, technically when you're not actually looking at your watch every so often the best conversations are when you don't look at the watch and then when you're finished you're suddenly like wow have we really been talking for that long it's like you don't believe yeah, it absolutely it's, it's like time stops at that moment while you're chatting and then suddenly time's back again and it's like wow where did all that time go yeah yeah um you know it's all about perception right if you're not if you're not sitting noticing every moment pass then they literally for you pass more quickly that's right time so, yeah. travel is real it's happening while you're talking to each other it is yeah every time you have a good time you're speeding up just a little bit you are so yeah yeah because when i li- when i've listened to to the show the times that I've listened to you two talking, it, it I, I get it now listening to it. it. It does actually sound like almost like you've got your points that you've researched. And then Ryan is almost more of the, or less of the research and more of the heart in a sense where he'll just interject and you'll go off on a tangent that, you hadn't actually researched because he's just come from a different point of view almost. That's not the, uh, researcher studier, just the immediate, Oh, what about this? And I, I think that's what make always makes yeah. shows great is when you've got two points of view or two ways of looking at things. And then you, you've also got the thing where occasionally you'll say something and you'll suddenly be like, I never thought of it that way, but thinking of it that way, that's possible. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of that. Um, And I think Ryan and I both having the ability to go back and forth and switch back and forth between those roles, I think has been crucial. Um, 
because we we alternate each week i i tell a story one week he tells the story the next week um yep one of us comes in with the bullet points right and and the other one is is reacting now i'm like i'm such a geek about this stuff that oftentimes like it's been rare that he came in with a story that i wasn't familiar with already right but like there are a lot of a lot of the episodes are first time reactions for him yeah like when he hears me read him the story that i wrote that's the first time he's ever heard of it um that that's happened quite a few times and that's really interesting i always like those because i like you were saying he'll offer these like fresh perspectives that that wouldn't occur to me because i've I've read so many similar stories or I've, you know, I've kind of, I'm locked in this way of thinking about these things. Um, but yeah, that it's a cool dynamic to have both. It is a really cool dynamic. So it, we've sort of touched on the structure of it where you will start with the, um, like, like I said, you'll start with the, um, the, the telling the story and then the response. I actually thought initially that you had recorded the story separately and then you record together the rest of it. But I'm guessing now that you don't actually do that. You read the story with him in there with you listening and then you go from there. Okay. So your initial, your initial idea was they're both true. Okay. So, um, the story that you hear when you hear an episode is, um, is recorded separately. Okay. It's because, you know, to do it live, it would, it, it just makes more sense logistically to do it and to make it perfect by myself at two o'clock in the morning. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but, in the moment when we're recording the second half, the debrief, um, I, I read him the story first. Okay. Or he reads me his story first. Like we go through the motions and like, cause I want to, the idea is to replicate that experience of just hearing the story. So we just do it. Yeah. Oh, so technically what you're doing is you're doing it there for the first time and then you re-record, so to speak, it so that it's so you've got it more clearer and with less pauses and yeah. interjection. So it's a steady stream of you saying it and then you cut to the original recording of the two of you doing the debrief after the story. Yes. That's how it's put together. Um, <clears throat> yeah, because the stories are um, are pretty produced. The idea is to like, even people who aren't really into like, you know, they don't want to get deep in all this, all these stories. They can always just come by and listen for like a 15 minute scary story. You know, like it's going to be fun. It's going to be weird. If Even if they're not into us, like, you know, going over the minutia of like, well, this person investigated this in the sixties and, you know, not everyone's into that stuff and that's fine. Um, but we have something for people who just like a good, scary story, a good, a good short scare. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking the only way you could change that would be if Vincent Price was still alive and get him to do the story at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, there are a lot of masters out there that like, that are, man, I, 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 I would love eventually to be somewhere between Vincent Price and like Robert Stack. Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're just like those iconic voices that scared the pants off of us when we were kids. Rod, Rod <laughs> Serling with, you know, the yes. Twilight Zone. Yeah. Twilight Zone. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So how do you, so what, what do you record with and how do you edit the show together? Or, or is it Ryan that actually edits the show and does that? Um, f 
for, so, okay, so for the the main show on Tuesdays, the ones with the where we actually do deep dives on a subject, Ryan does the editing for those. Yep. Um. So the process is fairly straightforward. I record on my end. He records on his end. I send him, you know, my file, and he just goes for it. He does all the magic. We write all of our own music for the show. That um, that's a yep. little time consuming. Um, that's a big part of it, but yeah, he does, he does all the editing for, for the main episode. Now the fireside chats that we do every Friday, I, I edit those. Okay. Yep. Just to like, kind of share the load. They're also a little easier, honestly, of the two of us, Ryan's the editor. He's the, he's the sound guy, but the interviews are pretty straightforward and I feel like they're within my capabilities. <laughs> so in order to take a little, you know, take a little of the, the balance, yeah. you know, to strike a balance between the two of us, I, I edit those. But you've, you, you're using the exact same sound files that Ryan uses in the main show as well. So I, I'm, I'm giving too much magic away here. I think by, by saying that there's this, it's an incredible sound file that you've got there of the of the fire burning and the crackling and and everything. That's that's an incredible sound grab that you've got there that you use throughout the shows yeah. to give it that sort of like you said. It's like people at a campfire chatting about scary stories and and that. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's brilliant. You've got that same. So you've got the same everything that he's got there. Do you use the same software and everything as well to edit as he does? I actually don't. He uses um, he uses Logic Pro. Yep. And I use Waveform. Um, but I'll I'll let you in on a little secret, which is that that sound file of the campfire we captured ourselves. That's a real campfire. Um. Yeah. Right. It, it's a real camp. That yeah. That we. We, the only thing we changed, the only thing, because every once in a while we'd have to like toss a log on yep. on the fire to keep it going. And we, we ended up cutting those out because it was, you know, it's such a spike when it would happen. But, and we just kind of wanted a steady thing. But yeah, we recorded it for an hour and a half. <laughs> we just kind of sat quietly around a campfire for an hour and a half and recorded. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's great. So, so your everything is self created then the sounds, the music. I mean, my, my music is created by me as well. So everything is self contained. The, I'm guessing that the logo is the same as well. One of you two came up with the logo, I'm guessing. Actually, uh, a dear friend of ours did that for us when we first started. Um, but not all of our, we would love to get to a point where we're doing like actual Foley all the time yep. for, for the episodes. Cause the, the stories have full sound design. So, but a lot of those are, you know, they're, they're found. You need a spare room with things in the back, don't you? Yes. Yes, I would, man, I've dreamt of having like a, a room for Foley. Um, yeah, just making weird noises, recording. We There are a few times that we've had, we've struggled to find something that we really need and we'll just make it. Oddly enough, recently, the sound of a car pulling up on gravel. Yep. Was, it proved to be very difficult to find. So we just took a mic out and we pulled a car up on some gravel. And then we had the sound. Yep. So, yeah. Yeah, big, big washing up bowls, people. They're useful because washing up bowls, you can put grit inside there so you can move grit around in there. It sounds like people are walking. Or you can put water inside mm -hmm. there and splash the water to get water splashing. And f foldy work is so much fun. Oh, yeah, it is. It definitely is. I love making the same sound over and over again. And then afterwards getting to hear how different every take was. 
and it, it's a like fully unique sounds and you're doing the same thing. It just goes to show how much of an art it is, you know, because you can pull that car up on gravel a hundred times and you're going to get a hundred different, like distinctly different sounds. Yeah, because the gravel moves differently each time as well. So all the gravel's in different places, so it sounds different when it moves. Uh, But then again, Mm -hmm. sometimes you'll find that you've not quite got what you want. And then by accident, I've done this before when I've I've recorded natural sounds, I've recorded, and then I've accidentally played two at the same time. And I've thought, that's the sound I'm after. I'll have them both put together, yes. mixed together to get that exact sound that you're after. Yes. Yeah, that that's a great point. That's something I think a lot of people don't, they don't try. Yep. And that that's a big thing because the idea you have in your mind is actually exaggerated from what it would be in real life. Yeah. Right. So it, it needs to be bigger to be what you want it to be. Um, and especially in audio format, it's really okay to take, to take, you know, to take measures like that where you, cause things need to be a little bit bigger, right? Mm-hmm. If you're, if you're telling a story in audio, you need like, you need the, the full metal sheet shaking, you know, that it doesn't mm-hmm. sound like thunder, but it sounds big and loud and scary. And it makes you feel like you're hearing thunder, right? Yeah. That's a big part of it. I mean, a punch that you hear in a film is not how a punch really sounds. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's more like a, that's more like a broomstick breaking over the side of a tree. Yes. You know, that, yep. that's not what it sounds like to punch a person. No. Yeah. That's true. But um, it's, it's almost like um, an audio version of, uh, of a comic, of a cartoon strip that you find in newspapers in a sense where a cartoon strip is an exaggeration and it's a caricature. So when you listen to sound that they had into a film or into a radio drama or something, that's an exaggerated sound that isn't the real sound. It's the same sort of thing. It's a caricature, but because your head, when you're listening to these things, you're not listening for the real thing. You're listening so that you hear something and you're like, Oh, that must be what this is. Because if you heard it in re- the yeah. real life version of it, you wouldn't actually associate it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because when you're around someone and they and so when you're around when one person punches another person, it's not the sound no. that you pay attention to, right? It's the visuals. So when you're left with just the sound, it has to be more than because most people don't remember what it sounds like for a person to punch a person. Um, So it's, it's more like, it's more about evoking the thought that you want than it is being, you know, lifelike. Absolutely. Hey, it's Gil from the The mind. Today's mind culture and social podcast. And you're listening to, Pods like us. So, are there any standout episodes and tales that you've had on your show? That's a good question. Um, Today we released our 52nd main episode. Thank you. Thank you. That's me clapping quietly. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. um, It's a bit of a milestone. Right, fifty-two weeks. Yeah, it's um, technically a year. Right, so there, th- I've had a few favorites along the way. I, I'm a, I'm really into um, indigenous lore, the stories that have been being told for you know hundreds of years. Um, I really we covered a place in Canada's Northwest Territories called Nahani Valley. Yep. And it's this place that it's like a time capsule from before the last ice age. Like it's a valley where the mountains are that surround it are so steep that literally the, the glacier split in half and went around the valley. It, the glacier, the glacial drift that was happening during the last ice age, it just skipped this place. And that, so you have, 
old growth forests like nowhere else on earth. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And they have a waterfall in there. It's called, uh, I believe it's called McKinley waterfall yep. it's twice as tall as niagara falls i mean just incredible geography that you can't imagine and it's the whole place is packed with stories of creatures of ghost tribes that were you know most likely just warring tribes um othering each other but um just these incredible stories. There were gold miners that went up into the valley looking for gold in the um, during the gold rush. That there were like fifteen or sixteen of them in a span of a decade that were found, you know, headless. <laughs> that never came back. Their bodies were found headless. So there's this weird mystery. Um, yeah, I love that story a lot. There's so much to it. I've often told people that I feel like that's the story we've covered that I feel like I could write a 500 page book on. Now you need to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. There's a lot of episodes of yours that have jumped out at me and a couple that, that I'm thinking of at the moment. Um, interview wise, I've really enjoyed your chats with the, uh, who people know as Darwin. Um, Vuk, is it Vuk Stavik? Is that that isn't real name? But Darwin, yeah. that was fascinating. He does the shows Darwin's Deviations and Tracing Owls, and then his oh yeah, and then his occasional co-host on Tracing Owls. You had uh, Christina, for, uh, the Crescent Hair, on as mm -hmm. well recently, who's an incredible illustrator and artist. Uh, and those those two shows recently have really jumped out at me as being fascinating just general chats where it sounded like you like we were saying early you got into a situation where you were just talking freely and not watching the clock you were just talking and kept going on and on until suddenly realizing oh we've reached a point now oh, wow we've been talking for this long and it had that sort of natural feel to it where you were just in that moment both times yeah, um, <clears throat> Christina and Vuk both are people who I could I could talk with, accidentally talk with for hours. Yeah. Like we've, I mean, it's been a year now. I met both of them, met you know online. I started corresponding with both of them within the first few weeks of us launching the show last July, yeah. um, and it's never stopped. We just we talk regularly all the time anytime one of us finds something weird that we're interested in we talk it out um so when i have them on it really is like hanging out with an old friend and it i think it shows it's it's very comfortable i have to be careful not to release a two-hour episode every time i have vuk on yeah it's yeah. and it's so easy to just let him hold court and just talk you know like I could sit and listen to him talk for, for hours, but yeah. Thank you. Those, those are two of my recent favorites too, of the fireside chats. Absolutely. I mean, um, we were, we were discussing Darwin before we started recording and, uh, we were both saying how, you know, he, he doesn't particularly like people, should we say, bigging him up and extolling his virtues is is very reserved in real life and very shy as a person yeah about it but his his knowledge is um i had that joke with you last week when we were chatting online where i said that is is like i call him the Dar Dar darwinopedia or something where his knowledge yeah. is just immense and incredible you'll pick something like about cryptids or about you know hauntings and this and then suddenly his mind is full of all the information on this subject. His, his knowledge is just immense. And the same goes for Christine yeah. with her knowledge as well. Yeah. With, I'm, I mean, with Vuk, he could, he could spend, you know, four hours telling you about like a, some poison arrow frog in the, in, in the jungle, you know, or some weird, uh, 
version, some weird mollusk that you've never heard of. He just has like a library of knowledge on it in his head. It's being friends with him has been invaluable. Yes. I mean, in so many ways, he he's also like a, a really sweet person. He's like you said, he's like, he's a bit shy. It's funny because on the, on his original show, Darwin's deviations, he's an absolute madman. Yes, he is. Yeah. Like it's, but he's so not like that. And that's why when I interview him, I refuse to re- call to refer to him as Darwin because I'm like, you're not actually that person. It's, it's like, you're, you're separate from that character. Um, cause he's such a sweet guy and Darwin was insane. <laughs> that character was insane. Yep. So yeah, it, it's cool. It, it's awesome when you get to know people like that. And realize like these shows really are produced, you know. Yeah, but I think much like yourselves, Darwin or, or, or Vuk will have really good production values, like you do with your shows. You know, you've got that sound quality. Even though he says that his his, his equipment is, <laughs> to use his words, <laughs> he says he's got shit equipment. He still does yeah. something that's really good with that equipment that he's got. And you yourselves have got a very similar ish sheen to your production in a way where it's, it's got a, a through from beginning to end. There's no cut out. There's no anything. It's just, it's just yeah. clear all the way through and it's got a good feel to it. Yeah. I, I, I believe in consistency above all. So no matter what you're doing, um, people notice change. That's what, that's what people notice, right? There's a reason why when you like, sometimes when you leave your house for the day and come back, you're like, Oh, it kind of smells weird in here. I should figure that out. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, um, but you don't notice while you're there all day, you notice change. So I think it's very important to, to have um, continuity within an, within an episode, nothing turns me off to a podcast faster when you know on that initial listen when it's obvious that um, tones will change, rooms will change. You can tell that you know the host was recording in a closet for this, but all of a sudden they're dropping in, you know, they're dropping in something they wish they'd said. Yep. a few days later and now they're in like a hallway <laughs> you know um stuff like that kind of dr- I'm like a stickler for that so and I think it shows but you want to know something wild about the show Darwin's deviations that I just discovered a couple weeks ago go on then because I know Vuk talks about how bad his equipment is but Darwin's deviations in its entirety was recorded on an Android phone. Yes. Yeah. Because he he said that on the show when I had him on the show, he was saying it was just recorded on his phone, which is crazy. Oh, it drives me crazy. I'm a, he's some kind of editing wizard over there because I've recorded on phones before and it's okay, but I don't know how to get that. No, no. And we have a history in engineer <laughs> in sound engineering as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It's just every time I learn something new about what he did with that show, I respect it more. You know, he's, he's he's like, um, how should we put it? He's like, he's like the Brian Wilson of the, of the music and sound world where you'll listen and you think, how did they do that? And even to this day, you can't understand now. How did he get that from that? Yep. That's yeah. That's a perfect, perfect example. There you go. If you're listening, Vuk, you like uh, Brian Wilson. <laughs> that's right. So, um, what advice would you give to anybody if they were starting a podcast themselves? Um, that's something I've thought about because, like I said, when we started, I feel like the the like 
real world advice was few and far between. Yep. What I like to say is there were a lot of cat posters, not a lot of substance. Excuse me. Yep. So like generally the, the, the main advice I would, I would give someone is a concept that I remind myself of regularly, which is community over commodity. So that's huge. And I know it's funny. I was just making fun of cat posters and then I wrote one, (laughs) (coughs) but yeah, community over commodity. Like I sometimes hear people give the advice, like learn to sell your show, you know, which, and there are podcasters who are doing it to drive a, a business. Right. And that's, that's great. But like for those of us who aren't in that space, who aren't, you know, using a podcast to push a business. It's, it's really about like, you have to be focused on building a community around your show. Cause if your show, if it's, if you don't have a community, then your show becomes a commodity. You're just selling your show like a product. Yeah. And I think listeners can, they can hear desperation pretty easily. Um, my other big piece of advice would be for anyone who has a co-host, a setup with a co-host, you you absolutely have to choose a partner who you can be honest with. Yep. That's huge. And I don't mean like, I mean, it seems obvious, but I mean actually honest. Like, don't pick someone that you have to make it, that you feel like that you would make excuses if you're going to, if you're running late. You know what I mean? Like the kind of person you would say like, oh, traffic was bad, even when it wasn't, when you really just didn't get off the couch when you should have. Um, like someone that you can actually be honest with and someone that you're comfortable telling them to get their act together when they need to. Right. And yep. even more importantly, someone who will do that for you. That That's been... Cause people talk about like the chemistry Ryan and I have on the show and that it's, it's valuable for the show, but far outweighing that has been our ability to be real with each other. Yep. And that that's huge. It's allowed us to go 52 weeks straight. We've never had a late episode. We've never missed an episode. We've never missed an interview. We've, And we're able to do that because when we're recording an episode on Thursday and it gets to Wednesday and I haven't seen a first draft yet, I, I have no problem going, Ryan, what's going on? Like step on it. You know what I mean? Um, and he does the same thing for me. So, and there's no, like, you know, it's not awkward. There's no, I know that I can say that to him and we're still going to be friends tomorrow. You know what I mean? And I think that's really important when you're picking a co-host. You have to be honest. And even like for big business decisions, because at a certain point, you know, if your show does well enough, eventually you start to realize that, oh, we're business partners. Like this isn't just doing a fun thing together. We're business partners. So you have to be able to talk business with that person too. Like you have to be able to, to settle like business bank accounts. You have to be able to balance the books together. You have to be able to go and you need to be comfortable saying like, I put a hundred dollars in t-shirts last month and I need you to cover this one. Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I think honesty between co-hosts is huge. That's the advice I would give. I think that's sorry for the rambling, but yeah, that's fine. Cause I mean, this section, I always ask that question because it's helpful to people to hear it. If you go into the more detail that you go into in, in advice, then the more helpful that it is to anybody that's starting out for the first time, I think. Um, yeah. But what, what you were just saying there, I mean, I, I don't, this show is just me most of the time, but I'm guessing that another part of it is that, so if you're having these sort of like business 
so to speak, discussions. If it gets too much, I'm sure that there's also a case of where, do you know what? We'll come back to that in a few minutes. Let's have fun for five, ten minutes and remember where all this started from. And that sort of centers you that you go back to that. What was the sense of fun in the show in the first place? And then you'll come back to the the business side of it if it's getting too much. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and I think it's it's the fact that Ryan and I have been, we're in bands together for so long. Yeah. We, we're really good at breaking the tension with each other. So if we're, say, having a, a, one of those business conversations, you know, a very, like, earnest, serious conversation and as soon as we can tell that the other one is like it's getting a little tense it it just takes a a, you know one comment a little inside joke and we'll laugh and we'll you know get back to get back to normal just take a break and yeah and i have we have in the past like been like okay we need to just like if we disagree about something time out there's sometimes we have to just like table it we'll talk about it later like let's change the subject for now cool off because like we are we are both very passionate about the show we we love it you know like at this point we love it like a baby um so it it's easy to get a little fired up a little more than you should probably <laughs> and we both know that tendency in each other and we both know how to handle it. And yeah, so we act accordingly. Yeah. To, to go off on a tangent, it reminds me of, it, it's something that I actually miss a lot uh, from back in band days when I've been in bands, uh, because that is the, that is the rehearsal room mentality that you've got there or the studio mentality that you've got there where, you'll be spending so long on one certain thing that it niggles after a while that you're not quite got what you're after. And you you take that time out. And in a way, you know, no people, people that haven't been in bands or whatever won't get this bit, but in some way, some of the best memories of being in bands are those moments that have nothing to do with actually the recording or the, or the, 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 performance they're the moments where it's yeah. just you as friends as buddies just having your time together like the times when you'll go around to visit each other and you're meant to be writing a song together but do you know what i'll watch this film with al pacino yeah. or I'll watch this steven seagal film or something and we're just having that time between yeah. us because that's just as important if not more so in a way than than everything else about being in a band. And that's that's probably one of the biggest things I miss about those days of being in a band. Yeah, that same here. It's the camaraderie. Yeah. It, it's everything. Um, and that's kind of a thing that, that we tried to, I think Ryan and I both were missing it. I know I was. Yep. I was missing that a lot in my life. As a, you know, a father and a husband, you, you kind of look back and you're like, that's one of the things that you, that you really miss is all that time that you got to spend with, with friends, just, just free and easy, you know? Um, and we, we kind of have recaptured that idea of doing the, doing the podcast, you know, when we on recording recording nights to me now i look forward to the way i used to look forward to rehearsals yeah in bands cuz it's just you turn everything else off and it's just you and your friends and and nothing else matters except what's in the room when you're doing it you know yeah i mean i'm i'm getting yeah. the i'm getting the impression that you and ryan probably used to do this what you're doing in the show i'm guessing that you used to be like this in those situations where you'd just be chatting about these things generally. And yeah, that, that's just what I feel is that you two would have been talking about that anyway, in a band situation. And you've kept that going constantly since that then as well. 
Yeah, that's that's definitely the case. I think um, our conversations for the show are more well researched than the, than they were yep. before. But yeah, we were. I mean, we were definitely. I mean, we were definitely talking about all the weird stuff that interested us all the time. So that that was an easy transition into the into the podcast for sure. It's something we're comfortable doing with each other. Hey there, this is Bobby with the Rock Guys podcast, and you are listening to Marv Smooth on the Pods Like Us podcast. Check him out. So outside of your own podcast, because we all have to listen to our own podcast as well, what other podcasts do you like to listen to yourself? Um, I've kind of gotten away from listening to podcasts in the same, that do the same thing we do, yep. the same or that are in the same niche as we are. Um, the only one that I still listen to that covers the same sort of topics that we do is a show called belief hole. Yep. Um, and it's, it's just a stellar show. Um, a lot of what I listen to are audio dramas. Yes. I listen to a lot of audio dramas and I, I love the sound design. I love the voice acting. Um, I recently started re-listening to a show called Tannis yep. that I listened to a long time ago. Um, and the gaps, you know, when the pandemic hit, the gaps got big between their episodes and between their seasons, as did with a lot of us, with a lot of people. Um, but so I went back and I started listening to it from the beginning because I listened to it when it first came out. I think that was like 2015. 2015- 15, yep. 2014 2015 yep. um and that's been really enjoyable i listen to a lot of audio dramas from a company called seven lamb productions they make um tower four they make um one called story which is really good there i mean there are a lot of audio dramas that i listen to i am i started with like the way a lot of people did with like welcome to night Vale and yeah. you know, all those, those huge ones, but there are so many small ones that people don't pay attention to, you know, there, are, um, like the scarab archives yep. is a really great show. It's, you know, there, I mean, there are a ton just, really look into the audio dramas i would recommend it atlas avenue beat is really good um there to i really like um det- like detective noir stories yep um i'm a really big fan of that style yep you, you would like uh i discovered it and i've listened to there's a, there's not many episodes of it available at the moment and they're on a break at present but there's a uh there's a uh, you you would probably like it's called Inspector, and it's uh, it's it's done in the way so it's I N an Inspector as in ghost and not Inspector, because okay. it's actually a ghost who's also a detective, and he investigates Excellent. he investigates paranormal incidents and deaths and murders and things that are caused by that and it's fascinating okay. it's really fun uh it, it but not safe to listen to when your kids are with you i will sure. say that it's very risque and has a bit of language yeah, in there yeah you can yeah the listeners can also assume any of those shows i just listed you probably shouldn't listen to with your kids around yep <laughs> Yeah, completely different, but another yeah. drama. Bright, the Bright Sessions. That's got bad language in it. Oh yes, and some scenes that are that could be seen as uh, quite a harrowing disturbing. at times. Um, I've, yeah. I've got a couple of Lauren's. Yeah, the Bright books, Sessions actually. is brilliant. Yeah, I've got a couple of Lauren's books actually as well. Lauren Shippen's books. Nice. And um, what else is the? You were talking about Tannis, and I don't know if you've heard of Ars Paradoxica. Mm-hmm. Oh yes. Yes. Yeah, that's another one. It's it's great. Yep. 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 I love that one. And that's there's that's there very are other shows that Yeah, it is. Makes me it think is. of fringe. It's very like otherworldly. 
Yeah. 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 Portals and, and yeah. Yeah. It's right up there. Um, there's, there are other shows made by the people who make Tannis that are really good too, like rabbits and the last movie is really good. The black tapes. Um, they do, a, they have a lot of great shows. Do you know, um, I'm going, I'm going to look on my phone now. Cause there's another one I've started listening to very recently. These last couple of days, actually, where is it? Let's have a look. Come on, Martin, quicker. There we go. <laughs> Here we go. The Chronicle, the Chronicles of Wild Hollow. Uh, here you go, Jordan. Don't know if you can see that. That's how it looks. Yeah. That. Okay. That is an audio dra- dramedy. Basically, it's a bit of drama with comedy and the uh, the ins- the investigator private investigator in that is a mouse which is very different excellent yeah. yeah i like that there you go i'm turning people onto all sorts i like here. a um yeah i i appreciate it i just yeah i just subscribe to it brilliant <laughs> But they they they, um, they contacted me themselves and said, "Oh, you might like to listen to us." Basically, they do stories where they'll, which is in they've they've created this sort of like land called Wild Hollow. So one year they did three; they're all done in trilogies. So one season they had a trilogy about this investigator, I think, and I've just finished episode two of that, and they've done a second season and they're about to release the third and they're all three episodes for each. And each episode's only about 40 minutes long as well. So the whole trilogy would probably be 40, 80 would be around two hours long. Okay. So there you yeah, go. That's yeah. I'll definitely check that out. Um, I'm also a history guy, so yep. I love, a lot i love a lot of history podcasts of course i mean i'm a subscriber of dan carlin's everything he's ever made has been brilliant yeah um i've listened to his you know hardcore history on world war one probably 20 times (laughs) and that's like 18 hours of content um but yeah it's there's a lot of great history podcasts well, it's fascinating because you listen to that, and I mean, I've listened to episodes of that multiple times as well. Um, and you listen to it, and there's things that I mean, I thought I thought I knew a lot about the the Second World War, and then he will mention things, and each time I listen to it, I'll notice something different each time, and think, "Oh, I didn't realize that." And it's just yeah. interesting the little minutia that he that he gets that you don't see in other places. It's almost as though in a lot of documentaries about that period, it's almost as though there's a certain way that they they want to avoid certain things and keep other things, whereas he's just there and he tells you everything. Absolutely. He doesn't yeah. he's not pushed by like a corporate or whatever to say, this is what you'll talk about, but you won't talk about this. He will talk about everything that is to do about world war two. And it's all in there. Yeah. Yep. Um, there's also a thing that happens with, with historical exploration, which is, um, you may see a piece, a piece written about, a a battle in world war one. You may, you may see that piece written 10 different ways through 10 different lenses. Yep. And so, um, what, what Dan Carlin does as, and I mean, he doesn't, he'll argue all day and say that he's not a historian, but the work he does is so deeply detailed and nuanced. He, I think he's, he's a historian and, the way he, the way he, the lens that he uses is it's purely a historic lens. Like you said, he includes everything, everything. So 
where you whereas you might see that subject covered on the discovery channel or on bbc or something where they're trying to tell the you know the environmental history of world war one you know or they're focusing on logistics or they're focusing on um, defense strategies um, so you don't get the full picture right because the lens they're using focuses on one aspect of that event yeah um, but when dan carlin tells it he tells you everything <laughs> everything and re-listening to those episodes it's like re-watching a season of doctor who like you're gonna get something new out of it you're gonna get like a connection you didn't get before you know it's yeah I meant to say World War One, not World War Two. Um, intriguingly, um, I've heard there's actually a film being made where the main subjects of the film are the war poets, uh, Wilfred Owen, uh, Siegfried Sassoon, Rupert Brooks, or Rupert Brooke, and all those people, because a lot of them actually knew each other. So it's based on fact of them being in the war and... So I'm sort of looking forward to that while at the same time hoping that they don't try to colour it away yeah. from reality in a sense. Yeah. I mean, it could probably do with a little drama, but I I wouldn't want to see, you know, those incredibly important and revered characters. I wouldn't want to see them reduced to like, to like romantic comedy characters. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, I understand what you're saying. So where can people find your show and get hold of you? Okay. So the podcast is available on every platform you can imagine. So anywhere you're listening to this, you can find us at a uh, campfire tales of the strange and unsettling. Um, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at campfire.tales.podcast. You can find us on Twitter at campfire, T O T S A U. And you can find us on TikTok at campfire.podcast. Um, I spend a lot of time on Instagram. So if you want to chat, hit me up on Instagram. I'm, all, I'm almost always available on Instagram. Um, but yeah. And I look forward to hearing from you. And he's very quick at responding, by the way. Yeah, I'm I'm there. I'm there for it. Like I said, community over commodity. So I'm nothing drives me crazier than seeing someone who's like complaining that their brand isn't growing or their show isn't growing. And then I'll see them post on Instagram and they'll have seven or eight people comment and they don't answer a single one of them. Yeah. And I'm like, you don't have time for the seven people who care about you right now, but you want to complain that your show isn't growing? Like, no. no. I'll I will definitely respond to you. <laughs> Absolutely. Anyway, thanks for speaking to me today, uh, Jordan. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thank you Anytime. very much. That's great. So um, you can find pod, Pods Like Us, just look for Pods Like Us on mainly Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Uh, it's on Facebook as well, if you want to go there. And you can contact us on any of those platforms or directly uh, podslikeus at gmail.com. So, uh, but anyway, thank you very much, everyone, for listening and hope you listen again to another episode of Pods Like Us.